Hello, the workshop will begin in just a few moments. It is currently about six or seven minutes until the hour. And um, so the screen is uh, rotating between slides here, uh, telling you the supplies that you'll need, some of the things that we'll be doing during the workshop. Um, if you're watching right now, I hope that you will stay with us. It's gonna get really fun in about six and a half minutes. We're going to be learning a lot of really cool magic tricks with stuff that you can find around the house. You'll be amazing your friends in no time at all. Of course, if you practice. My name is Tommy Johns. I'll be introducing myself formally in just a little while, but um, I am glad that you're watching. I'm glad that you're early and uh, look forward to, uh, to spending some time with you and teaching you one of my favorite, not only hobbies, but my profession, teaching you how to do some magic tricks. Tell you a little bit more about that in just a few moments. Hey there, my name is Tommy Johns. I'll be leading the magic workshop for the Tuscaloosa Public Library in just a few moments. We'll get started in about four minutes. Uh, we'll try to get started right on time. And so um, I'm glad you're here. If you're already watching, there are some things coming up on the screen. You'll need some of these um, uh, supplies for today's workshop. Some of those were for yesterday's workshop. The rest of them are for today. But if you've got these items uh, handy, I think we'll be using most of those uh, today, uh, with the exception of the rubber band and the paper clip. I think that's uh, pretty much everything. And there's some handouts. If you haven't um, printed those out yet, you will need to, um, uh, to go and do that. But um, we are going to be live in just a few moments.
As you can see, the countdown timer has started. We've got less than three minutes before we begin. If you've already tuned in, I'm glad you've joined us. I hope that you'll stick around because we're gonna have a lot of fun. Really looking forward to spending some time teaching you magic, teaching you how to do magic tricks for your friends and family. And I think you're gonna amaze some people. Some of the folks who attended yesterday are already amazing friends and family with the things they learned. Today, we're learning some all new magic tricks. So if you were here yesterday, then um, you, you know we had a lot of fun. If you are back today, know that everything that's gonna happen starting in about two minutes and 15 seconds is going to be brand new. New magic to see, new magic to learn, and new magic for you to perform. All right, we'll be right back with you at about two minutes. Hello, my name is Tommy Johns. I'm a magician, a puppeteer, a pretty funny guy, but mostly I'm a reader. I love to read. I'm really excited to be spending some time with you today at the Tuscaloosa Public Library doing a magic workshop. This is part of the uh, summer reading program that the Tuscaloosa Public Library is providing. This, of course, is virtual. Usually I do this at the library, and I really miss being there. I wish I was there with you right now. Um, unfortunately, the world is as it is, and so I am broadcasting live from the studios, uh, otherwise known as the guest room of my home in the Atlanta area, and uh, very excited to be spending some time with you, teaching you some magic. Before we go any further, I want to tell you about one of my favorite magic books. It's this great big thick book, and don't let the size of it uh, uh, intimidate you. It's called The Mark Wilson Complete Course in Magic and written by a guy named Mark Wilson. This book has been around for a long time, and it is a classic for magicians trying to learn how to do magic tricks. This book is big because it covers everything. It's called the complete course in magic because it is a complete course in magic. It teaches you how to do card tricks and coin tricks and rope tricks. It teaches you how to do close-up magic and parlor magic and stage magic. 
it will even tell you in here how to float somebody, how to make somebody vanish or appear, or how to turn one person into another. There are some really great magic tricks in this. Now, if you don't have this book at the Tus Tuscaloosa Public Library, let me encourage you to check out some of the over 50 magic books that they have in the system. I looked it up this morning. They've got so many books in the library, and I think you're really going to enjoy learning magic from books. That's how I got started. As a matter of fact, let me tell you about the very first time I ever saw a magic show. I was eight years old. I was in the third grade and a man came to our school. He walked out on stage with a card in his hand and on one side of the card, he had one spot. On the other side of the card, there were four spots. When he turned the card around again, there were three spots. And when he turned the card over one more time, there were six spots. I was amazed. I'd never seen a card that had four sides. This card clearly had four sides. One spot right here, four spots right here, three spots right here, and six spots here. But then, like you, I started thinking, wait a minute, he's not showing us the whole card. He keeps covering this up. Maybe, I thought, maybe he's only got five spots. Sometimes he makes it look like six. Sometimes he makes it look like four. On the other side, I was thinking he probably just had two spots. Sometimes it looked like one. Sometimes it looked like three. You see, I had it all figured out until he turned the card over one more time. And it really did have six spots. And then he turned the card over again, and it really did have three spots. And well, you know what happened next? I thought I was seeing spots before my eyes. Let's give that magician a big round of applause. All right. Very cool. All right. Let's. Something has happened here. Let's pin that. There we go. It appears. There we go. Okay, good. We're moving again. I was, I was frozen on my end. I was afraid that I had, uh, had somehow made a mistake. But I've told you about the book. I've shown you that. So as soon as that trick was over, I went straight to the library at our school. I knew that in the library, they had books about everything that you wanted to learn. And so I wanted to learn magic tricks. I went to the library, found a book, checked it out, took it home and started learning magic tricks. And I learned to do all kinds of fun magic tricks. I kept learning and kept uh, doing magic and performing all through uh, elementary school, through high school, through college. I got a magic teacher when I was in college. I met a guy who was a professional magician and he taught me even more and I started doing shows. And, uh, and here I am today. This is what I do full time. And I hope that what happens today is that if you already know something about magic, you'll learn something new. If you don't know anything at all about magic, you'll be inspired to learn magic tricks and have some fun with it. Whether you turn it into a career or whether you just have it as a fun hobby, either way, I think that you will, uh, you'll be able to enjoy uh, what we're going to learn today. Let's start out with a really simple, probably one of the first tricks that you'll see in most magic books. It's called the floating pencil illusion. It's where you take a pencil and you hold it in your hand like this, and then you take your thumb and your finger and the next finger, and one at a time, you release them until that, that pencil is floating right there on the palm of your hand. Now, here's what's really cool. What you didn't see, you saw all five of these fingers, but you only see four of these because that's how you hold the pencil in place. <laughs> you just got your, pen, your, your finger stuck out that way. And so when you grab the pencil, you pick up the pencil like this, and then you grab your wrist. This is what the audience doesn't see. You, when you grab your wrist, you put three fingers here and your thumb over here, and your other finger goes inside your fist on top of the pencil. So that when you slowly open your hand, on the other side, that's what happens. It looks like this, okay? So you, uh, you grab it, you, you, you grab hold of your hand like this, you, you open it up one finger at a time, and then you've got the pencil right there. Here's the really weird thing. <laughs> Sometimes it works without this hand. See, it, it actually does float right there in the air, right there, just like that. And then when you snap your fingers, falls right off. Let me show you the secret of how that is done. I don't know if you can see it right where you are, but there's a little bit of, of uh, clear scotch tape on the pencil. Now, I only put it on the pencil from right here 
around to right here so that the front of the pencil, you would not be able, even at close, close inspection, if you were here in the room with me, you'd be able to look at that pencil and not be able to see any tape there because there's not any tape there. So you make a tab on the back of the pencil like this. All right, so you stick the tape, you make a tab, you stick the tape like that, and then you take this and you twist it. And that is what you put between two fingers so that you can hold the pencil in place. Now, I like, I like to do this this way because a lot of people know this trick. And some people even know the one where you wear a watch and you stick another pencil in the watch band and have it sticking there so that you can take your hand away. I'm not wearing a watch. And I really like this because when you do this, a lot of times people say, oh, I know how that's done. you got your finger holding it. You say, that's, that's exactly right. I do have my finger holding it. That's how it works because I hold my finger right there on it and it really blows their minds. It is so much fun. And it's just a really simple trick. All you have to do is put some tape on a pencil, twist it up and practice. If you can't grab it right here, you might not have enough tape and so you might want to make it a little bit longer. Don't make it so long that it sticks out this side. You don't want them to see it here, but you want to be able to hold it and move it around very comfortably without it falling. And then when you get ready for it to fall, you can snap your fingers and let it fall Then reach over and pick it up and put it away. Obviously, they're not going to be able to inspect that. If you want to be able, them to be able to do that, just make sure that you have two identical pencils, maybe two unsharpened identical pencils. One of them you make float, and then when it drops, it drops into your case, and then you can pull out the other one and let them have a look at it and try to, uh, try to figure it out. It's a lot of fun. It's called the floating pencil illusion. Now, yesterday, we learned a lot of magic tricks. We also learned three of the rules of magic. There are five main rules of magic and there are a lot of other smaller rules, but the five main rules of magic are, uh, we're gonna be sharing those with you today, but let's review the first three. Rule number one, never tell the secret. I mentioned yesterday that uh, what I'm doing here is not telling the secrets. What I'm doing here is teaching you how to be a magician, teaching you how to do magic. And so um, rule number one, never tell the secret. There's a difference between telling and teaching. When you tell somebody the secret and you don't teach them how to do the trick, what you're doing is you're making them um, aware of how the secret is done, but you're not giving them any ability to do magic for people. And once they know what the, how, the, how the magic is done, once they know the secret, magic isn't as much fun for them anymore. And sometimes they'll even spoil it for other people. Oh, I know how he did that. He's got tape on the pencil. So don't, no matter how much they beg, no matter how much they ask, yesterday I gave you a good response to, uh, uh, to please tell me the secret of the magic. And you say, can you keep a secret? Well, so can I. Here's another thing. If they say, how did you do that? The answer, I did it very well, thank you. Now let me show you another magic trick. Always be polite and kind to your audience. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's rule number one. Rule number two is don't repeat a trick. Even if people ask you to, even if people beg you to, don't repeat a trick. Because what happens is if you repeat a trick, then they don't watch it the next time to enjoy it. The next time they watch it, they watch it so that they can figure it out. And that's not much fun for you, and it's not much fun for them, and it's certainly not much fun for the people around them. So if you want everybody to have fun, you need to remember rule number two, don't repeat a trick. Then rule number three, we covered this one yesterday. Practice, practice, practice. If you want to be good at magic, if you want to be good at baseball, if you want to be good at math, if you want to be good at cooking, if you want to be good at being friends with somebody, practice, practice, practice. They say practice makes perfect. I don't know that it makes perfect because I've never been perfect, but I do know practice makes better. And the more you practice, the better you're going to get with your magic tricks. A couple of reasons you want to practice. You want to do, be able to do magic as well as possible for your audience. That's reason number one. Reason number two is if you don't practice and you mess up in front of your audience, a lot of times then they know the secret, which means you've ruined it for them, for them and you've broken rule number one. Rule number one, never tell the secret. Rule number two, never repeat a trick. Rule number three, practice, practice, practice. We'll look at rules number four and five in just a few moments. But first, let's learn a card trick. 
I want to introduce you to four guys named Jack. There's, uh, there's Jack Club. There's Jack Diamond. There's Jack Spade. And there is Jack Hart. Four guys named Jack. They're best friends. They do all kinds of things together. And one day they decided they wanted to go to the Wizards Library downtown. The Wizards Library was located in a small building that was kind of nondescript. Most people didn't even know it was there. They had heard that it was there and they knew where it was. They went to visit. Now, one of the things they didn't know about the, the Wizards Library is that the Wizards Library had an entrance at the sidewalk level, of which is the first floor. And that's where the card tricks are taught. But if you want to know more magic, different kinds of magic, you have to go down the stairs into the basement. There are three basement levels. And these guys walked into the library. They said, we'd like to learn some magic tricks. And the, the librarian said, wonderful. What kind of tricks would you like to learn? Well, the first Jack said, uh, said what I'd like to learn is I'd like to learn some coin tricks. And she said, you're in sub-basement three. So he took the elevator and he went all the way down to the very bottom of the, of the library. He started learning some, uh, some really cool coin tricks. The next Jack said, I'd like to go to the uh, to, to learn a rope trick. And so she said, you'll need to go to sub basement number two, which is where he went. The next Jack said, I'd like to go to um, to learn some uh, some big stage illusions. I've always wanted to cut somebody in half. I tried that with my sister once, but now she's my half sister. <laughs> boom, boom, <tsh. laughs> you, you keep the jokes if you want. Uh, he, she said, you'll need to go to sub basement number one, and so that's where he went. The other Jack, he was very happy to learn some card tricks, and so that's what he did, and he decided he was gonna learn some card tricks, and that's where he stayed. Well, they were looking at books and talking to people and getting ideas, when all of a sudden they had just selected their books, they heard an announcement that the library was about to close. They heard that announcement, and suddenly there was a puff of air, a noise, and all four friends ended right back up on the top floor so that they could check out their books and go home. And that's the story of four guys named Jack. Now let me tell you how the, tr how the trick is done. You're going to take a deck of cards, and if you've got your deck of cards, you, you need to go through the deck, and you need to find all four jacks. I'm going to give you just a moment to do that, but you'll go through the deck, and you'll find all four jacks. Now, one of the ways I like to find cards when I'm looking for them is just to spread them out like this and look for them, but if you, don't, if you can't spread those out or you don't have room, just kind of go through them one at a time in your hand until you find the four jacks. If you don't want to tell this story about four guys named Jack, you could tell a similar story about four, uh, four queens or four kings or four fours if you wanted to for whatever reason. But you find four cards that are exactly alike. In this case, the story is about four guys named Jack. Now, this was the first storytelling card trick that I ever learned. I was probably about nine or 10 when I learned how to do this trick, and I've had so much fun with it. Now, the original story, you may see this in books. The original story was about four robbers who went to the top of a building, and each one of them went to a different floor to steal something different. I never really liked that because I, well, for one thing, I don't steal. And for another thing, I didn't really like the idea of them getting away at the end, which is what happens in that story. And so I decided to turn it into something different. And I asked some friends of mine who are magicians how to, how I might change it. One of my friends, Steve Ronker, who lives in Connecticut, suggested that we do a library. And I love that idea. So there's a wizard's library, and I tell that story. And, uh, and so if you've got your four jacks, you're ready to go. Now, here's the other thing you want to do. You want to find one, two, three other cards. It doesn't matter what they are. Three cards. And put those cards on top. So now you've got seven cards, and you've got your deck of cards. Here's what you do. Got the stack of cards right there. You've got the... the uh, the seven cards, the four jacks, and the three what we call indifferent cards, three cards that, uh, that it doesn't matter what they are, and you show the first jack. You say, I've got four friends, or there are four friends named Jack. Each one of them was named Jack. The first one was Jack of Clubs. The second one was the Jack of Diamonds. The third one was the Jack of Spades, and the fourth one was the Jack of Hearts. Put those all back together. You never show them these other three cards, and you'll see why in just a moment. So you've got to hold these. 
I like to hold them top and bottom with my thumb on the bottom with my middle finger on and I kind of straighten them up with my pinky finger. You after a little bit of practice, you'll be able to do that so that you can take one card, two cards, three cards and show them what looks like the fourth card. But it's really four cards, the other three cards and the jack. And then you put those all together and just lay them on top of the deck. Now, you probably have figured out what's next. You don't actually move the jacks to the, to, to the inside the deck. You take off the top card, which is not a jack, but they think it is because they just saw it. You put that near the bottom, push it all the way in. You take the next card. Don't let them see it, of course. Take the next card, put it in a little bit higher, and take the next card and put it in a little bit higher. All the while, you're telling the story of where these uh, guys named Jack needed to go in the library and how far down in the basement they needed to go. And then I, I just show the last Jack there. And most people, as a matter of fact, I've never had anybody catch me. Most people will not remember that that was supposed to be the card that was on top from the start. So you just show one Jack, he, he stayed up on top so that he could learn some card tricks. I have seen people take, the, take this one and just put it maybe one card or two cards down. I think that's taken an unnecessary risk because if you put it um, uh, three cards down or four cards down by mistake, then you've ruined the trick. So now you've ended up with three cards that are in the deck. Everybody thinks those are the Jacks and then you've got the Jack that's on top. Now you make a, you tell the story about it was time to check out. They made an announcement. There was a whoosh of wind. There was a sound. I like to make that sound with playing cards. And all you do is you just take and hold it and just let the cards flap one at a time, just like that. And all four jacks were back on the top floor so they could check out their books and go home and learn magic. Now, a lot of people are going to think, Oh, let me see that deck. I bet he's got extra jacks in here, had some on top, but they can look through the deck and see that it's just a normal, normal deck of cards. And then you can gather these jacks up, put them back in the deck different places and start on your next card trick. And that is the story of four guys named Jack. All right, let's move on to the next one. Still a little bit of mind reading. This is kind of fun. Um, Let's see, I've got Vince and Saquon here. Are either one of you, uh, they're both staff members at the Tuscaloosa Public Library. Are either one of you near your microphone so you might be able to help? Doesn't sound like they are. We're going to pretend that one of them is there. And um, I'll show you how this works in just a moment. But I've got a grid of nine numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Make a tic-tac-toe board and then just number these. You can do this on a plain piece of paper. You can do this with a pencil, a marker. But uh, let's say I called on someone from the audience and I said, I need you to choose one of these numbers. And what's going to happen is you're going to choose a number. I'm going to circle that number. And then I'm going to eliminate all the other numbers in that row and in that column. Columns go up and down. Rows go side to side. And then I'll get a second volunteer to, to pick one of the remaining numbers. We'll circle that one and we'll do the same thing. And we'll do the same thing for the last number. And I've made a prediction. I've got it on the back of the grid here. I've made a prediction as to what it will be. So let's say that the first person says seven. So I would circle seven. I would eliminate the numbers in that, in that row and in that column. Then I ask the next person, what number would you like to choose? Let's say they choose the number two. Once again, I eliminate the ones in the column and the ones in that row. You call in your third volunteer, there's really only one left. And of course, if we eliminated those which are already eliminated, here's the thing. If you add up the numbers that are circled, the numbers that could have been freely chosen, seven plus two is nine plus six is 15. And I predict your total will be 15. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so here's how this works. Here's how this works. You can, um, let's see. Oh, I laminated this so I, can, uh, so I can erase it. It doesn't erase real quickly, but you'll see how it works. Okay. All right, so we've got the grid. And let's say instead of choosing seven, they chose eight. 
we'll draw a square around it instead of a circle so we'll be able to keep up with it. So now you'd eliminate the ones in that row and that in that, in that row and in that column. All right, now we've got uh, four numbers remaining, one, four, six, and three. The next person could pick uh, three. And there and there, and that leaves four. Eight plus four is 12 plus three is 15. No matter how you do this, no matter as long as you follow the rules and somebody picks a number and you eliminate the ones in that row and in that column, you'll end up with three numbers that will always add up to 15. Now, if you love math like I love math, because there's so many cool things about math, you can expand this grid to be a four by four uh, grid, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, follow the same rules. You'll have four people choose numbers at that point and they'll add up to 35. If you get a grid of 25, five across and five down, one through 25 and do the same thing, I'll let you figure that one out. It's a bigger number obviously, but you can keep going and the principle applies no matter how big the, uh, the grid is. I think nine or 16 is probably about as big as you want to go for most people, but it is a lot of fun. I find it a lot of fun to experiment and see how math tricks work. This is called math of magic. And I hope that you'll do this. I hope that you will enjoy doing this trick for your friends. All right, there we go. All right, well, it's time for rule number four. Rule number four. Rule number four, always respect your audience. I can't tell you how many times I've seen comics and magicians, even musicians, disrespect their audience. There are several ways you can show respect for your audience. Speaking clearly, making eye contact, thanking your volunteers for coming up to help you, thanking your audience for being there, being kind to people when they do come up to help you, talking to them, don't insult them. I've seen people make fun of their volunteers' uh, clothes. I've seen people make fun of their volunteers' shoes. I've seen people make fun of their volunteers' hair. That's not a way to treat an audience. And one of the reasons that grown-ups don't want to help magicians is because at some point they either helped a magician or saw somebody magician and that person got embarrassed by the magician so my rule number four is always respect your audience respect your volunteers respect your audience members you know this is not a bad idea to respect everybody whether you're in a show or not whether you're just walking down the street going to the grocery store uh stopping to uh, stop and walk in your dog and stop stop to talk to somebody always 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 be respectful but particularly when you're representing magicians, always respect your audience. That's rule number four. Let's move on. All right. I've got a dollar bill here. This is a dollar bill. I told you yesterday that dollar bills are made of, uh, of linen and cotton and fibers. And some of the bigger bills even have little metal strips in them that can be seen uh, if you place a light behind them. And you can, you can see those things. Money has interesting and unusual principles. And one of the things about, about this bill is that uh, I can actually get it to, um, to defy gravity. Let me show you what I mean. If you fold it like this, now you have to make it aerodynamic. So I'm gonna put little wings on the end of it like this and like this. You can balance it you know, just like this. Balance it on your two fingers, just like that. But here's a really cool thing. If I move this finger away, I can balance it off center. You would think that it would have to be right there in the center, but because it's made of that special paper we talked about, you can actually make it balance on one end like that, which is pretty cool. Is it, bring it right here. Uh, let, me, uh, let me show you dollar bill. It's, just a plain, plain dollar bill. And of course my hands are empty, nothing in my hands. And uh, just a dollar bill. And it's really fun. Yeah, here's the secret to the trick. <laughs> you don't just use a dollar bill. This trick will actually cost, cost you a dollar and a quarter to do. <laughs> You're gonna need a quarter to serve as a counterweight. And what you do is, I like to go ahead and fold up the sides so it makes it a little easier. And then you can hide the quarter right there on the back of the dollar bill. I had it sitting like that on the table 
And um, nobody saw it when I picked it up, picked it up holding the dollar bill and holding the quarter with my thumb. Now to show that my hands are empty, what I did was I, I flexed the dollar bill like this. I showed that hand, hand empty. And when I put the dollar bill, uh, kind of folded the dollar bill like this, I just transferred the quarter over to this hand so I could show that this hand was empty. All right, that move takes a little bit of practice so you don't drop the quarter, but uh, you wanna be able to pop the dollar bill and uh, do that until when you catch you to transfer the quarter from one side to the other. Somebody's microphone is on. Let's see if we can, uh, uh, if you'll check that for me, please. All right, so I've got, um, I've got the dollar bill. I show it, I can even show both sides by covering that quarter up showing this side of the dollar bill and then putting it back in place. When you start working with a dollar bill and a quarter like that, you'll start seeing, if you'll follow those moves, you'll see how easy it is to do that with a little bit of practice. So I've shown it. Now I'm going to fold the top of the dollar bill. And what I'm doing is I'm folding it onto the quarter. I fold the bottom of the dollar bill. And so what I've done here is I'm making pretty much a little channel, a little tube for the quarter to be in. Now, there is a possibility the quarter would fall out if I'm not careful. So that's why I say I need some wings on it to make it more aerodynamic, okay? That's what we magicians call patter, what some people would call telling a big whopper. Uh, but uh, you don't really need those except that it holds the, the quarter in. And then you've got to move your fingers until you feel it balance. And then when you get it to that point, you hold your fingers here like this, and then you slowly move this finger away so that you can balance the dollar bill off center. Now, if you really want to challenge, say, now a lot of people think, well, could you do it with the other finger? Well, sure you can, and you just tip it up like this, and that makes the quarter slide to the other finger, other side. And if, you, if I had folded this correctly, it would slide right over there, there we go. And now you can, Move that finger and let it balance on that finger as well. When you get ready, if somebody says, let me see that dollar bill, you straighten it up like this, let the quarter fall out into your hand, and you can even hand them the dollar bill. Don't drop it. <laughs> you can even hand them the dollar bill to inspect while you hold the quarter in what we call a palm position, okay? So you hold the quarter like this. It looks like your hand is empty, and uh, but the quarter is right there see that and uh, hand them the dollar and let them inspect it let them try to do it they won't be able to do it of course without the quarter that is called the gravity defying dollar bill trick okay all right we're gonna do a classic of magic we're gonna make a coin disappear but to do that i've got to cover up the coin i'm gonna cover it up with this cup and we're gonna use a few napkins, a few paper napkins to cover up the cup so that you can't see what happens when the magic begins to start. So we're gonna cover that up with that napkin and that napkin. Let's get, uh, let's get three of them, okay? So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna cover this up, okay, just like this. I'm gonna make it where there's no possible way that quarter can escape. Now you see that the quarter is still there, okay? So we've got the quarter under the cup. Now, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say the magic words, abracadabra, and that quarter is gonna be, gonna be vanished, it's gonna be gone. Ready, here we go. Abracadabra. Wave your fingers over the top. <laughs> okay, let's, let's try this again, let's try this again. All right, so here we go, ready? Abracadabra. Maybe if I snap my fingers, that'll work better. And, oh man, let's try it one more time. One more time, here we go, here we go, ready? All right, abracadabra, wave the fingers over the top, snap your fingers. This time, give it just a little bit of pressure. That might have been too much pressure. And quarter's still there, but oh man, the cup. Where'd the cup go? <laughs> All right. This is called the vanishing, in many books, it's called the vanishing salt shaker trick. 
But I discovered that, um, well, I'll tell you that in just a minute. But it's called the vanishing salt shaker trick. It's, you can use it as the vanishing cup trick, but don't ever call it that because you don't want people to expect that the salt shaker or the cup is gonna disappear. I always call it the vanishing quarter trick. And then I make it seem like I made a mistake. Here's what happens. That cup actually went through the table, completely through the table and I caught it under, no, that's not what happened at all. Here's what happened. You take the quarter, you take the cup, you take the paper napkins and the paper napkins, I always say, I'm covering this up so you can't see the magic happen. And what you do with the, with the paper napkins is you form, you make a form over the, um, over the cup so that you can pick it up and show that the quarter's there. You place it down here. You say, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the magic words, wave my fingers over the top, and we're going to make that disappear. You do that, and then you fail. You can't, you, somehow, for some reason, it doesn't work. But what you've done is you've set up the expectation that every time you show the quarter or show it, you know, potentially show it vanished, every time you move the cup back this way. The last time you do it, when you move the cup back this way, what you do is you bring it to the very edge and you drop it in your lap and hope that it doesn't fall too far, which that one did that time. And this is why you don't use a salt shaker. Salt shakers are usually made of glass. And if you do catch it in your lap, if it lays on its side, it will pour salt all into your lap, which is no fun at all. So you uh, end up with it, uh, end up with the cup, it, drop it in your lap, and then you bring it right back out. It's still got that same form. Everybody expects that the cup is under there. And you say, let's try it one more time. Say the magic words, wiggle your fingers over the top, snap your fingers, whatever it is you've done before. Plus, I need to put just a little bit of pressure on it. Here we go. Ready? And you look surprised and the quarter's still there. And then it dawns on you that the cup is gone. Now, if you, if you have something else you need to do, or if you want to do another magic trick, or if you're, you know, if you're at the dinner table, you can have this go, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute cup went through the table and now you're ready to do the next trick if you're in a place where you can just leave the cup in your lap it's really pretty cool to for the, the people who are watching to think that you just made this cup completely disappear they'll take the napkins they'll try to tear them apart see if the cup is in there they saw the cup earlier and um, so you want to use a plastic cup not a glass cup and, or glass, glass, and uh, and a quarter, or a coin, or a, or an eraser, or you can. Uh, it's really fun to borrow a quarter from somebody. And uh, sitting at a table, you can, uh, you know, finish your drink, put a cup over the top of it. If you're using a paper cup, a lot of times people think that you smash the paper cup flat, because you could, I guess. And then when you lift up the napkins, the cup is gone. Okay, it's called the vanishing quarter trick. It's actually the vanishing salt shaker trick. Okay. All right. Very good. So what uh, what's next? Oh, rule number five. Very important. Rule number five. Rule number five. Always, always, always have fun. I love doing magic shows. It is my job, but it's a job that I love and something I've really missed since we've been in lockdown since the middle of March. This is uh, actually these shows that I'm doing for Tuscaloosa this week are the first magic shows I've had in over two months. I've never had a time in my life when I had two months with no audiences at all. And so I'm really excited to be here with you guys having fun doing magic. Magic is to me is one of the most fun hobbies that you can do. And I know there are people who love fishing and people who love football. And, and I, I love those things too. But for me, magic is always fun. And if you're not having fun, you need to either find a way to have fun or maybe find a different hobby, but always have fun. If you have fun, you can help your audience to have fun. If you have fun, it's easy to be respectful of your audience. And one of the best ways to have fun is to be good at it. And for that, you need to practice. So all these rules kind of tie up together in have fun. And I hope that you will have fun while you learn and perform one of my favorite hobbies, magic. All right, we've got just a couple more and uh, I want you to learn these. Uh, this one is one of the handouts that uh, or one of the, the printouts that you got. On the printout, you were, uh, there was a, one of the pages, was five cards and the backs of five cards. And if you take those and cut them out carefully, 
Don't cut them apart, cut them out carefully, and then fold them together like this and either glue or, or put some uh, double stick tape. I would probably put glue if I were you. And, uh, or you don't have to, you could, just, uh, you could just hold it like this. And you're gonna put a paper clip on the odd card. Now you can make this with real cards, but I know not everybody has 20 or 40 decks of cards around the house like I do. And uh, your parents might get a little upset if you glued five cards together. But if you, if you were to glue five cards together, it would look like this. You'd have two black cards, a red card, two black cards. On this side, you've got five different cards. Now here's what you're gonna do. You're not gonna show them the backs of the cards. You're simply gonna show them the card with the, um, with the paper clip on it. And you're gonna take the paper clip off and you're gonna say, I've got a challenge for you. I wanna see if you can put the paper clip on the ace. Now I'm gonna make it easy the first time, harder the second time. See if you can put the paper clip on the ace. Of course, if they put the paper clip anywhere but right here, they're trying to mess you up, but they will do that. They'll, they'll accept the challenge and then they'll take the paper clip and they'll put it right there on the ace. You say, that was pretty easy. And I say, yeah, that was pretty easy. Well, here's the hard part. I'm gonna turn it around so that you can't see the ace. Let's see if you can do it now. Well, of course, they know that the ace was in the middle and so they'll go one, two, three, and they'll put the clip right there. You say, now, would you like to change your mind? And they'll say, no, that's where the ace is. And then you turn it around and they've missed the ace by two cards. Here's what happens. This is actually an optical illusion. Most optical illusions are things that we only see and they, we, when we see them, they change or they, they somehow trick our eyes. This is actually an active optical illusion because what happens is when people see that one, two, three from the end is where the ace is and you turn it around, they make the same assumption, one, two, three from the end and that's where they put the clip. I have found that you can fool almost 100% of the adults. You can fool about six out of 10 kids. Kids a lot of times will figure out, okay, if that was where the ace is and clip the ace, gotta be right there. And they'll get real close to it. Sometimes they'll miss it just by one card. Sometimes they'll get right on it. But almost every adult will, uh, they'll, they'll assume that, especially if you're a kid doing this trick, they will assume, oh, you're just a kid. How hard could this be? And they'll always pick the third card. They'll put the clip on there and they'll always miss it. If you really want to have fun, <laughs> you can tell your dad, hey, if you get this right, I'll do your, one of your chores this, this weekend. If you get it wrong, you do one of my chores. And dads love challenges like that. And so, you let them do it the easy way, and then they have to do it the hard way. They'll almost always end up in the wrong place, just like that. It's called clipped or the clip card, and it's a lot of fun to do with your friends. I really like putting gluing five cards together. And if you get permission, if you've got an old deck of cards um, where you can um, can do that, you can certainly do that. If not, this will serve the same purpose and will look exactly the same, and it will work just as well. To, uh, to trick your friends and family, okay? All right, this last one is something that uh, I've been practicing for a long time. What, I what I've got is I've got a paper bag, a brown paper bag, and I've got a little cup with five different colored balls in here. I've got a light pink, I've got an orange, I've got a green, I've got a yellow, and I've got a dark pink ping pong ball. If I had been able to find them in primary colors, red, yellow, blue, and then find a purple and a green, I would have done that. Those are secondary colors, but these were the ones I could find. So remember, we've got two pinks. We've got a light pink and a dark pink. We've got an orange, a yellow, and a green. I've also got this brown paper sack. And here's what we're gonna do. This trick is called a touch of color because I have tuned, I have, uh, I've worked and practiced so much, I can actually see colors with the tips of my fingers. We're gonna drop these into the bag, shake it up like this. The first one I'm gonna bring out, I'll find the green one. I'll find the green one. That's not it. That's oh, pretty certain. It's the green one. It's the green one. You might think, well, I peeked into the top of it. No, nope, I'm gonna hold it up really high, move it over this way. Uh, let's go with the dark pink this time, the dark pink. 
right? Nope. There we go. The dark pink, dark pink right there. Drop that in there. Do it again. Do it again. This time, let's go with the um, let's go with the light pink. Light pink one. Yep. All right. Found that one. Got two left. Two left. The yellow and the orange. Let's go for the orange. Yes, definitely the orange one. And of course, the easy one is the last one, the yellow one. And that is called a touch of color. You might think, wow, how did you do that? Of course, I'm a magician. So of course, I cheated. Here's the thing. You will need for this trick a brown paper sack. You'll need a cup or something to hold the objects in. You can use different colored erasers. You can use different colored uh, crayons. Just make sure that they all are brand new and they all feel and look the same because a lot of your friends are going to think, oh, well, those weighed differently or one of them has a, a rough spot on it or one of them has two bumps on it. He knows the green one has two bumps. None of that's the case. These really are just ping pong balls I got at the sporting goods store. And so I've got these five ping pong balls, nothing unusual about them. There are no magnets, there are no hidden weights or springs, no smoke or mirrors. There's actually nothing at all interesting about the, uh, the ping pong balls that I use. Here's what, here's what you do though. This is not just an ordinary brown paper sack. It was yesterday morning, but this is a special sack that I have designed with a window. So that when I drop the balls in there, from my side, I can see exactly what I'm getting. Now you can do this uh, where you get somebody to call out a color and you reach in and you feel around till, they, till you find the green one, if that's what they call out. And all you have to do is just watch until you, till you find the green one and then you pull that out. Sometimes I like to, nope, that's not it, that's not it. And then move my hand around again and then pull it out and you find the green one. Here's how you make the bag. You want to take a brown paper sack, and every sack, this is a little bit of psychology here, <laughs> psychology, it, okay, um, the, the sack has two sides, there's this side which has the seam, and there's this side which has the little cutout up at the top, and the flap at the bottom, what you want is you want to do this on the flap at the bottom, and most of them come with a little line, a little folded line across here. What you wanna do is you wanna take a pencil or a pen and you want to draw a line just below, just below that crease, all right? Then you're going to draw a line this way and this way and this way so that you end up with a rectangle, okay? Take a pair of scissors and very carefully cut that out. Now, here's how I, here's how I start cutting. And I'm not gonna build the whole thing because we don't have enough time to build the whole thing. But uh, you take your pair of scissors and you'll fold the bag just a little bit like that. And that'll give you a chance to cut an opening right there, and then you'll just cut across there and you cut that square out. Then you take just a regular zipper, uh, Ziploc bag, uh, it doesn't have to be Ziploc brand, take a, a regular plastic bag, cut out a rectangle larger than the hole you've cut here, but not bigger than the bag, okay? So it doesn't need to be wider than the bag, but it needs to be taller than the hole, and you take scotch tape, stick it on the, on the piece of, of plastic you got there, and stick it on the inside of the bag. When you've done that, when you've done that, you've got a bag with a window in it. And when you fold that bag closed, like a normal bag would be, it looks just like a normal bag. You can show both sides of it. Don't make a big deal out of, one of the problems that magicians run into is they say, this is a normal deck of cards. Well, it instantly makes people think it's not a normal deck of cards. <laughs> so just say, I've got a brown paper sack and I've got five 
whatever, erasers, crayons. What, uh, if you take uh, different colored paper, you can roll paper up in different, uh, maybe a half sheet and, uh, and make five different colored paper balls and drop those into the, uh, into the bag. When you open it up, of course, you want to open it so that the window is on your side and then get somebody to drop. Matter of fact, somebody can even stand right here and drop the drop them into the bag for you. They will almost, they'll never see this if you hold it kind of close to you like this. Even if they look down in it, they can't see the window, okay? And then all you have to do is when they call out a color, you reach in and grab one of those and then uh, pull it out and you have amazed your friends, okay? All right, that one is called a touch of color. I want to do one of my favorites, and that, those are optical illusions. We've got just a couple of minutes, and I want to show you some optical illusions. The first one I want to show you is, um, how are you feeling, Mr. President? Now, this is a jumbo picture of Abraham Lincoln from the $5 bill. You can do this with George Washington on a $1 bill. You can do it with uh, Alexander Hamilton or Thomas Jefferson. Uh, anybody who's on a bill, of course, Benjamin Franklin is not a president. Be aware of that. Um, a lot of people talk about uh, money and the presidents that are on them, but not, not, not all of them are presidents. But what you can do is you can make Abraham Lincoln smile or frown, depending on how you fold the paper. So here's, here's a picture of Abraham Lincoln from the $5 bill. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold it in half like this. I'm going to fold it back up like this. And watch what happens. As I tilt this toward the camera, he smiles. As I tilt it away from the camera, he looks sad. Now don't pull it all the way out. If you pull it all the way out, it'll, it won't change expression. But if you've got those creases in there just a little bit, you can see him smile and look kind of goofy and happy. You see him frown and be sad and upset. And you can do that with every one of the, uh, every one of the people on the on, on American currency. So if you borrow a bill from somebody, you say, oh, you know, I've always thought Abraham Lincoln looked so serious, but um, I wonder what it would look like if he smiled. And then you fold it and you create the optical illusion that he's actually smiling and looking kind of happy. So here's where you fold it. You're going to fold it right in the middle, right down the middle of his nose. You're going to fold it out this way so that uh, so that the, the back of the bill comes together and the front of the bill is still visible. Once you've done that, you're going to make the next fold right across his eyeball. And you're going to fold that one in the opposite direction. And then you're going to do the same thing with the other eye and fold it there. So that what you've got is like the most exaggerated W you've ever seen. Okay, a little bitty hill in the middle with, uh, with the big uh, edges, the big wings on the side. Okay. All right. And now, of course, you don't leave it folded like this. You pull it about uh, most of the way out, but not all the way. And now when you tilt it toward the person, he smiles. When you tilt it toward you, he looks like he's frowning. It's an optical illusion. I call it, how are you feeling, Mr. President? Unless you use it with Benjamin Franklin, and you'll say, how are you feeling, Mr. Franklin? Uh, oh, here we go. This one is, uh, is done with two arcs, a blue arc and a red arc. The blue arc is obviously longer than the red arc, unless you change perspective and move it in front. And when you get it closer, obviously it looks bigger. Now here's the really weird thing. When you put it back here, it really does look bigger. It actually grew while it was moving towards you. Here, we can do the same thing. We move the blue one here so that it covers it up and it looks way, way bigger than the red one. But when I move it back here, now it does appear to be bigger than the blue one. A really weird thing. Put them side by side like this, put them on top, and you discover that they're exactly the same size. You can also destroy the illusion. What happens is the one on top, you're measuring this curve against this curve. So it's a matter of perspective. The eye measures the shorter curve against the longer curve. But you can also destroy the illusion by putting them back to back like this, and when you put them like that, they look like they are exactly the same size. Actually, let's see, this would be more like, yeah, more like this. So they look like they're exactly the same size this way, but when you put them like this, the red one, the one that's on the bottom, will always look longer than the one that's on the top, okay? 
you got these in the printout. They came out like this. You color them different colors. My advice would be to color them and then cut them out. It's a little easier to color the color a whole sheet than it is to color something that's cut out, especially around the edges. Uh, you can paint those if you want to. Uh, if you if you're really good at Photoshop, you can fill those in. But uh, you want them different colors. You could also do this with the sleeves that they put on coffee cups to insulate the uh, the coffee to keep your hands from getting too hot. They're curves like this. They're much shorter. They're more um, more along this size. And the same thing works. You can hold one above the other. If you mark one with A and one with B, or if you take a marker and you write short and long and the short one uh, on top and then move it toward the person. And then when you bring it back, then the one on the bottom, which says short is now longer. And so this is called the Jastro, J-A-S-T-R-O-W, Jastro illusion. About 150 years ago, a psychologist named John Jastro discovered he was studying how the how eyes, how people's eyes perceive things, and he um, uh, he discovered that this was uh, was something that would fool people's eyes. It's called a Jastro arc, and I hope you enjoyed that. Last but not least, I've got a, a dragon here, and this dragon is really cool because this dragon can look at the camera. No matter how I turn his body, he keeps looking right at you. It's really very cool. And it's a really cool illusion because it only works for the camera. If I turn this around and I look at it, it doesn't have that effect. If I move it back and forth, it doesn't look like he's moving his head back and forth and watching because all it is is a cutout and taped together of, uh, of this, which is also one of the printouts. This one's a little complicated. So when you cut it, you're gonna need a, a, an adult to help you read the instructions and to make the finer cuts and to tape it together. But uh, it's really fun and you can have a lot of fun if you talk, if you talk to your grandparents or talk to a friend on, um, on face, uh, FaceTime or something like that, Skype, you can, uh, you, can, you can show them this optical illusion. All right, very good. We've learned a lot of cool things today. We've learned the five rules of magic. We've learned how to make a pencil float two different ways. One is the, the way that you reveal and the other is the amazing way where it floats. We've learned about four friends named Jack. We've learned how to read somebody's mind or predict the future. We have learned how to make a quarter vanish underneath a cup. Actually, the quarter doesn't vanish, the cup does. We've learned how to make a dollar bill uh, levitate off balance. We've learned uh, the clip card which is here somewhere, there we go, the clip card where you can trick adults and uh, get them to clip in the wrong place. We've learned a touch of color, which is one of my new favorites, and we've learned some optical illusions. I've had a lot of fun. I hope you've enjoyed the time that we've spent together today. This has been great. My name's Tommy Johns. Go to the library, read all summer long. I look forward to seeing you next year at the library. Bye-bye.